Hi, my name is David Noble. Welcome to the channel. So the F1 season is nearly upon us. By the time this video comes out, testing will have finished, and as usual, we'll have read far too much into the results. This isn't going to be a predictions video, although I may hint at who I think will do all right, but more of a reminder of where we're at coming into the season. As much for myself as anyone else, to be honest. So let's get started. Haas. The whipping boys of F1 since Williams started to get their act together, the team have a lot to prove this season, especially in the aftermath of Formula 1 turning down Andretti's application. It's all changed at the top with the dismissal at the start of the year again for Steiner and the promotion of Ayo Komatsu. Probably pronounced that wrong. Difficult to say how this will work out, as Gunther was simultaneously arguably the biggest strength for the Haas team, and possibly its biggest weakness as well. There's no doubt that his presence as one of the most recognisable faces in the sport brought Haas a lot of screen time and recognition when the times were hard, but if you're the boss when things are going as badly wrong as they have for Haas in recent years, then you're going to be out of a job. It was kind of coming. So, what can Haas take from last year? Well, the car in qualifying was actually pretty decent. You know, on raw pace, they weren't the slowest. The problem was largely down to tyre wear, not too dissimilar to Ferrari, who Haas do share multiple co components with, and most importantly, perhaps the engine. Word is that the new engine guy at Ferrari has been concentrating on giving better drivability to help reduce wear. Now, if that applies to the customer units, when... Hess's experienced driver lineup of Nico Hulkenberg and Kevin Magnussen could put the car to good use, but I feel that structural issues in the way the team is set up and their reliance on outside assistance on the technical front might hold them back. Stake F1 Sauber Last year's Alfa Romeo team are kind of kicking the heels at the minute. The big move for them will be when Audi takes over in 2026, if Audi take over. In the meantime, they're just kind of, I don't know, existing? As of all the teams on the grid, they've kept the same lineup for this season, and it's actually a surprisingly marketable one. The quiet Finn, Valtteri Bottas, has become quite a quirky presence in the paddock in recent years, with his charity bottom calendars and his business at the front party at the back hairstyle. You know, he's managed to be kind of fun and interesting without shouting about it. His teammate Guan Yu Zhou, or Zhou Guan Yu, depending on where you're from, is a bit of a marketing dream in the year when the Chinese Grand Prix returns. As the first Chinese F1 driver and being young of an interest in fashion, he kind of represents a youthful, forward-thinking China. You know, it's his shop window to sell himself which he might need to do with Audi looking at their options. Whilst he's by no means a bad driver, to stay on the grid when there's so many youngsters fighting for a seat, not the least of which is Salva Reserve Taylor Pocher, he might need a significant increase in his sponsorship portfolio. And a team that may get some points finishes, but it's unlikely to trouble the top six in the constructors, impressing might be a tough ask. The artists, formerly known as Alpha Tauri, I mean, how much fun are the commentators going to have with this one this season? There's a meme somewhere about Joey from Friends trying to say the team name and saying, well, Toro Rosso, probably. Visa RB Cash App Formula One team. Yeah, that's memorable. Um, I remember someone on Twitter saying they were just going to call them V-Carb and be done with it, and you can kind of see why. It's not just the name that's changed, though. More changes at the top. As Franz Tosta's retired, Lauren Mekis has taken over, having finished his garden since leaving Ferrari. A very strange season last year, where at stages they seemed to have real momentum, and other teams that had more drivers in the team than points. That said, it's the drivers that are the reason anyone's paying any attention to them at the minute. Yuki Tsunoda has shown that he belongs in F1. Quick on his day, he's slowly getting less ragged, but it's the car next to him that people will be watching. Well, question marks over Sergio Perez at Red Bull, Daniel Ricciardo has already been considered as likely to take it over. So, to do so, he needs to impress. His year last year showed some of the old honey badger, but was too broken up by coming in mid-season and then being injured to really form an opinion. He'll be well motivated to push the team forward, with more shared parts apparently with the bigger brother team from Milton Keynes, as every reason to think they will. Williams. Is there the stirrings of a revival at one of the most famous names in the sport? James Fowler's arrival as team principal seems to have breathed new life into the team, and he's talking a good game in terms of returning the teams to success in the future. And he kind of needs to. Of the team's 28 points last season, 27 of them were scored by Alex Alban, who Vales desperately wants to keep at the team. With seats coming up in the top team, so that could well prove difficult. 
While there's been considerable improvement, they can't hide from the fact that they finished 92 points behind the next place team, who were themselves 160 points off the team in front of them. Logan Sargent was retained at the end of last year, despite having a trying 2023. But let's not get it twisted. During his junior career, he was frequently fighting two for nail with Oscar Piastri. The talent is there. The biggest improvement needs to come from the car, though. They've shown they can race in the points. They now need to do it consistently. Alpine. It's difficult to remember sometimes that Alpine are a works team. Last year they managed to finish some distance behind two Mercedes customer teams. The activities behind the scenes and the constant hiring and firing has meant that stability has been kind of increasingly difficult to come by, and the plan for getting to the front of the year is constantly getting set back. Surprisingly, perhaps, the one bit of stability that they've managed to keep for now is on the driver front. When Pierre Gasly joined Alpine, we were kind of expecting fireworks, and the story of how he and Esteban used to be friends and then suffered a mess of falling out is pretty well known at this point. You know, two French drivers who didn't get on, fighting for dominance in the same team? That'll take some management, we said. It does seem to have worked, though. On the face of it, the pair seem pretty even, and they have the talent. You know, a few people managed to live with Fernando Alonso as well as Ocon did in 2022. It's the equipment under them which is questionable. The season hasn't started yet and they're already talking about needing an engine boost because they're 15 horsepower down on the other teams. Track depending, last season they were yo-yoing between nearly getting a podium at one race and not getting out of the bottom six and qualifying at the next. Whilst they were perhaps the best of the midfield, that's only because Aston Martin and McLaren had made the jump to racing Mercedes and Ferrari for podiums. The Enstone outfit are a team with history. With running backing, there's no reason they shouldn't be making the jump to the next tier as the other teams have done. But currently, you just can't see it happening. Aston Martin Dan Fallows has said that the AMR24 is an exciting evolution, and that kind of makes me worry for them. With so many other teams looking to go for a reasonably fresh piece of paper, evolution is an underwhelming word. But the biggest worry for them is if they can keep Fernando Alonso happy. We all know that a motivated aloe is capable of, but we also know the drama that a disgruntled aloe can bring. And I know I've said it in some of the other teams that it didn't matter if both drivers had scored equally, but in Aston's case, it's a huge difference. Of the 280 points that Aston Martin scored in 2023, Nando scored 206 of them. In a hypothetical world where Lance could live with Fernando and match that, they'd have potentially finished second in the Constructors instead of the fifth they eventually plummeted to after McLaren remembered they were a top team. Now, I know we talk about Lance Stroll's job being secure, but Lawrence has to deal with other shareholders. With Aston having a hypercar project potentially in the wings, might... Lance might do well to look at that. I mean, I actually think he'd be pretty good at endurance racing as qualifying tends to matter less than a 4-24 to hour race and qualifying seems to be tends to be where he's let down the most. There's a lot of teams behind them in the standings that have a point to prove this season and Aston will need both drivers on song to hold their constructors position, never mind improve it. Yeah. Can Lance get the results the team needs or will Fernando's back give out carrying the team again? McLaren It'll be interesting to see how the team from Woking starts this season. After a poor start to the year, they managed to turn it around in 2023 so significantly that in the second half of the season, the only driver to outscore Lando Norris was Max Verstappen. Whilst there was a significant points gap between Lando and Oscar Piastri last year, Oscar learnt a lot over the course of the season and put in some great performances. His second season should see him being even closer in what is looking like a very interesting inter-team battle. The people at McLaren have certainly been making all the right noises about how good he is. Then we get to Lando. A regular podium finisher now, he's still chasing that elusive win, but there's no doubt that he's a potential champion in waiting given the correct equipment. I don't think this will be McLaren's year, or maybe even next, but if they can maintain the momentum that they had at the end of last season, then that elusive first Grand Prix win for their drivers can't be far away. Ferrari how many years can the Tifosi get their hopes up? I mean, truthfully, I don't think anyone is expecting them to win or even threaten to win a title this season. Over the last few years, the car has consistently been quite quick in quality, only to suffer badly on race pace, whether through tyre wear or balance issues. Fred Vasseur has quietly been making improvements to the team, which will hopefully improve their fortunes. In 2023, we saw better pit stops and less strategy blunders than in previous seasons, so stuff is working. 
The car last year started off problematic, but the first upgrade of the year put some understeer into the car to help tyre wear and at least make it a bit more predictable, and the second built on that to find performance. For the first time in what feels like a long time, a Ferrari upgrade actually looked like the team had understood it and it did what it was supposed to. Now, if this sounds like I'm a hater, I should point out that yeah, I'm a Ferrari fan. You know, I want my team to do well. But it got to the point over the last couple of the seasons where the drivers would be in a good position at the start of the race and all I could think was, so what's going to go wrong this time? It looks like they're starting to minimise that with any luck. The drivers are in an interesting position though. Carlos is out at the end of the season, but he said that he'll still be supporting Charles this season to get the best result for the team that they can. But at the same time, if he's not already signed a contract with someone else, possibly beginning with Audi, he's going to want to be doing everything he can to beat his teammate to make himself look like a driver that a team would want to sign. You know, not that beating Charles is exactly an easy proposition in their time together, despite Charles arguably having worse luck. And don't get me wrong, Carlos has had his fair share too. Charles has out-qualified Carlos, had more wins than him, had more podiums than him, finished ahead of him more times than they both finished. I mean, that said, Carlos is a hard worker and has a great racing brain. He's quick enough to cause Charles real headaches when the car is more neutral to under and balance. Will they spend more time fighting each other this year than the other teams? Mm, hopefully not. As to the car itself, apparently there's been work to give the engine more drivability, which should help tyre wear and therefore long run pace. But Ferrari seem to have gone a different route to a lot of their competitors with suspension set up, which may hurt them. I mean... At this point, I've heard um, people talk about them possibly bouncing a little bit more than some of the other teams during testing, which is not ideal. Uh, one report I saw said that the car was seven tenths a lap quicker than the car they finished last season with, but we won't know what that means in comparison to the gains other teams have made until the action begins. Mercedes. Having your star driver announce it as signing for one of your main rivals the following season is perhaps not the way you'd want to start your year. However, the talk at least is that it's business as usual of the Brackley-based team. Lewis has one more season with them, and that's where his focus is. Now, if the inter-team dynamics of Ferrari is interesting, at Mercedes it will be fascinating. I mean, how badly will George want to win that battle to prove to the team and fans of the sport that Mercedes can still do well without the talisman that's been Lewis Hamilton? On the Mercedes website, they describe themselves as We have the courage to fail, the character to be accountable, and the strength to see failure as an opportunity. Each day we fail is a day for our rivals to regret, because those are the days when we become even stronger to beat them again. Now, fittingly, it reminds me of what Nicky Lauda used to say about learning more from failure than success. It's something of a mantra. Of course, it's easy to say sentences like that, of course. Much harder to put those words into meaningful actions, because, I mean, if teams always got stronger through failure, then Hass would be unstoppable. It's true, though, that Mercedes aren't afraid to take risks, and they've got their thinking caps out again and come up with an interesting front wing. It attaches to the nose of the second element of a legality wire connecting the fourth element, which, apparently, because I'm no aerodynamicist, should help the airflow to the underside of the car, and the FIA have deemed it legal. You know, it's good that they're willing to take risks after how severely the last one backfired, and hopefully for them it will help close the gap to Red Bull. Although, perhaps... Because I'm a Ferrari fan, I hope it doesn't work too much. I don't know. <laughs> Red Bull. I suppose we'll better address Red Bull. They're having something of an unsettled start to the season with the investigation into Christian Horner. However, at this point, the car is built and the rest of the team still know how to go racing. Simply put, for this season, even if they have to get an interim team boss in, it's really not going to change very much. The car is still a new car, the engine is still the same strong unit as last season, and Max is still going to Max. A bad season for them, honestly, will be actually having to fight for the title, and as much as that's what we'd all desperately want to see, it kind of seems unlikely. They are the champions elect, and I should be able to talk about them for ages, but there's likely to be a little in the weight of surprises here. The car will most likely be nearly as dominant as last season's, and Checo will probably be as likely to be irrelevant. We know that if he had a car that suits him, he can do great things, but Max is in the other car. The team have been geared towards Max for a while, and when it comes to upgrades and directions on how to extract performance, do you listen to the guy who's winning and looking 40 million plus euros, 
or the guy who's struggling to get into Q3. And Checo needs to do well this year. It seems almost a given that he's going to be out at the end of the season unless he can actually stick with Max. But even if he thinks he might get shoved out the door at Milton Keynes, he still need to perform well to try and get himself into another seat. I mean, in fairness, he's been here before, so it shouldn't hold any fear to him. He knows what he can do, and he mostly believes in himself, even if last year was pretty brutal. You know, I've no doubts the team will be as slick and as professional as ever. I also have little doubt that Helmut Marco will say something that will make us wince, and I suspect that a good barometer of how concerned they are about other teams will be how much time will Adrian Newey spend looking at other cars. You know, seriously, someone put a stopwatch on him. So... All that remains to this video is to say thank you for watching. If anyone has any different thoughts for me, and I'm sure they will, by all means chat about them in the comments. Um, but bye-bye for now. Thank you for watching. See you later.